battered and grieved. See the devil wanna scatter and deceive. And God's no love, he'll leave you battered to bleed. Every day getting the sadder we need. The love of Jesus Christ instead of another platter of weed. I pray the Lord has mercy on my soul. Sometimes I find me climbing up the ladder of greed. How you guys doing? Uh, my name is uh, Minister Tyrone Williams. I'm a, a resident of Sacramento, California. And a lot of you guys already know me. I have a story currently out that's called Tyrone Went to Hell. I just basically want to give you guys a, a more updated, you know, version of it. And also to bring to note on all the comments that I received of all you guys out there in the world. Some good and some bad. You know, for those that were believers, I thank you guys for your battling, you know, the unbelievers for me. You know, for I did not choose to comment on a story, but the truth, you don't have to fight the truth. Either you're going to believe it or not. And before you believe what I say, you have to believe the Word of God. For in believing the Word of God, you can confirm the story as truth. Because God's Word is no lie, and He reveals about heaven and hell so many, so many times. So I just want to you know bring back to light uh, my portion of the story and also to bring to light some new things that have happened in my life since the story because he came that we might have life and that more abundantly and I just want to bring to light the abundance of life that Christ has filled me with on this side of, of life after the accident so, we started uh, the story off. It happened in uh, 2001 of, uh, of July, the summer. And uh, I was coming back from Weed, California. And uh, traveling back from Weed, California that morning, me, a young lady, and her two year old son were driving back on I 5. And we had a car accident. Now, what caused the wreck was that she fell asleep at the wheel driving. But before she fell asleep, I was driving and started to fall asleep. So that's what made us switch seats. So as she's driving the truck down the highway, I would fall asleep in the passenger side of the truck. Her two-year-old son is behind us in the cap part, not in the seat belt, but just laid on the back seat sleep. And... It happened that she fell asleep and we were in the middle of the freeway out of control and the truck was, you know, rocking side to side and hitting bumps and that's what woke me up to look to my left. And when I looked instantly, I seen her asleep. So, you know, naturally, you know, just simultaneously waking up, seeing someone sleep, you grab the wheel. And uh, I grabbed the wheel and she woke up out of her sleep and woke up and hit the brakes because we weren't on the road we were in the middle of the road on the grassy part so it's uneven and and instantly the left tire blew out being hit in the pothole or whatever I don't know it blew out and when it blew the truck just jackknifed and started to tumble and flipped and we flipped several several times and I'm seeing sky ground, sky ground because I'm I'm rolling. And all of a sudden, for me, that's when it went dark for a while. <clears throat> because I would get knocked out. The young lady side of the story as she came to an accident is that when she woke up from the accident, you know, concussion, so bleeding just and trauma, just in pain and shock and looks over, checks her son, you know, looks behind her, and in the midst of looking behind her to see her baby, she sees my right hand sit next to her in the seat, and me nowhere to be found, so instantly, you know, she goes into shock and jumps out the truck and looking for me, and that's when we said the young man that saved me, his name was Arube Magani, he was driving from the Bay Area, and normally he would take the highway 101 to ride the coast, he said, up 
towards uh, Oregon, where he went to school at. But this time, God would delay his trip, and he would reroute him up I-5. So as he's coming up I-5, he comes across the accident, and that's where God will use him to do what he did, and that's in saving me, that's in finding me. So the man, Arube, got out the car, he said that, he came up to the young lady and he was asking her, are you alright? Do you need help? And she's just screaming, oh my God, oh my God, where's Tyrone? Screaming and he looks at her, you know, and he's looking, you know, how a person, you accident, a person's lost, you, you're you confused, but yet you want to find them and there are people stopping along the freeway because we stop coming and going traffic. So he says that people are walking up to the to the site, to the accident site, and he said as he's looking at the young lady and he's talking to her, another man walks up behind her, so in his peripheral, so he's looking at her, but yet sees him, and he points, and he says that he's in there, and that's who we said was the angel because no one else knew where I was, but God. So for God to use the man or that person to point to the young man to Arube to show him where I was, to point to him where I was. That's when he looked at him like, well, okay, you know where he is, why didn't you go get him? So he said that he just ran and hopped the barbed wire fence and before he dove in, he looked to see where might, you know, he be at. You know, where might a, a point of entrance be in this pond? Now, like I said, the pond was size of a football field, you know, width and length. So where do you start and where do you begin? You got all this water. And then it's not clean water or clear water where you can just see what you're looking for. So he dives in the pond, he said, and he's swimming in darkness and he comes across me because God leads him to me. Out of all this body of water, as he starts to swim up underneath the pond water and swimming in darkness, God leads him right to me, and he touches me. And he grabs me and he pulls me up. At this time, I'm not alive. I'm <laughs> not breathing. <laughs> I'm bleeding to death. On top of, uh, I had two liters of water and mud in my lungs that they drained from the hospital. And then on top of that, gangrene has set right into the wound. So I have an infection that's spreading straight to my heart to take me out. And they, he said that when they pulled me to the shore, he pulled off his shirt and gave it to the people that were on the shore because they started, you know, trying to do CPR on me. And I coughed up the water for a second and, and passed back out because of the amount of water still within me and on top of all the blood still leaving me. The blood is the life source. And when you lose your blood, your life is leaving. And at that point, I had an experience where I was in and out of my body, yet while my body lay at the edge of the water. You know, because they revived me right on the bank of the of that pond. And I was in and out of my body. I was yet able to see, you know, from above, but yet feel from within. So I'm feeling my body, but yet above it, looking around, you know. And then it went black again. And then I was revived a second time by the paramedics. The life flight, the helicopter landed on the freeway and flew me back to UC Davis to where they would uh, put me in a coma state to see if I would live or survive after they did their patchwork. I didn't have insurance or any of that so I didn't get President Obama's, you know, service. <laughs> I got the poor man's service so it was a patch up but it was all that needed to be done. And it was just time for God to, to react, perfect time. Because in the midst of me 
being in that coma, I would have my experience and what I would have. And that's when I had my hell experience. And I went inside and I was allowed to see the same thing that the rich men saw. You know, in the Bible, Luke chapter 16, verses uh, 18 to 31, you'll read the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And the description in which God described, you know, separating those in a place of paradise from those in a place of torment. It's exactly the same thing that I've experienced, you know, and trying to get out of that place. But God let me know that it's not by might nor by power but by his spirit a man has to receive the spirit of God and that's the very reason that Jesus Christ came into the world to save the world from eternal damnation and I thank Jesus Christ for rising with all power because if he hadn't arose with all power I wouldn't be here talking to you today so that's just evidence that the word of God is true for he said all authority has been given unto him both in heaven and on earth so he has the keys to death hell and the grave and he has mercy and compassion on whomever he chooses to so yes there are a lot of questions where people say well why you <laughs> I ask the same thing but like he said in his word I have mercy and compassion on whomever I choose so it isn't even up to me to question why did he do it for me but just to be thankful that he did because it could have been someone else he didn't have to let me out but that he let me out and he gave me a second chance of life that I may be a witness to others who are headed down the same roads that I was on now he may not give you a second chance but he's giving you this story this testimony as a detour for you before you get to that point so what he did for me I'm truly thankful and I stayed in a coma for it was about five days you know four or five days as I went through my experience in hell and the different things that I saw there was you know a lot of people they want to know they want to know <laughs> it's real is very real. Matthew 5.30 says this. If thy right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is more profitable that a man lose a piece of him rather than all of him to dwell in hell forever. So God has given us scripture to highlight the truth of his word. Yes, it is better that some people go through these experiences, you know, that he can save you in the midst of what you're enduring, you know, because you'll cry out, you know, and in the midst of you losing feet and arms, he says in his word, <laughs> you know, it's better for you that you enter like main or with no legs or with one arm or with one eye instead of for you to dwell in hell forever so for a lot of people that are whole you really want to check you know and evaluate yourself yeah there are people that have one hand or one leg but that's a sure enough ticket that they don't have to go to hell huh see it's those that have all of their members as the one that really need to evaluate themselves and do a heart examination. Mr. Tyrone. Yes, sir. Would you mind taking us to when you first entered into hell? I remember you explaining <clears throat> it to me the first time you explained it to me and man, it just sent chills. And uh, you're describing it and you were saying that, um, you know, when you had people ask you, was it a dream? And you said, no, I had all my senses there. And you said your senses were even more amplified mm -hmm. when you was in hell. Can you kind of elaborate on that? At that point, <clears throat> when it's, the way it was for me, it was when my body was cast into the water, my spirit, my soul 
left from my body from the drowning and the loss of blood from the water and the loss of blood so I came into this cave in the earth and it was like I popped out of the water so as I'm coming up out of the water and I'm looking around like where am I and I'm looking I look all around and I see the the walls of the cave I see this is the earth that I'm in it's like this room I'm in here you could tell that you were in a place <laughs> but I was in the heart of the earth and I could hear screams I could hear cries and I'm looking around and I'm trying to see and I was allowed to see because of the glory of God his presence there because it's a place of darkness so you're not you know going to see too much <laughs> but when God's presence is there I was yet able to see what was going on and uh, man it was the the weirdest experience you know uh, being at the shores of this water it was the the screams you know, I, the, the, the cries, you know, the moans, the groans, the, you know, the, the questions. You know, it was a, a cave full of questions that the truth has set in. You know, it was, I'm sure everyone in there had reason within themselves, but truth has set in. And a lot of people were disappointed. So you had di cries of disappointment cries of anguish cries of hurt you know cries of regret cries if I just get one more chance so you have all these different types of screeching cries that are going forth and yet you're in this place and you're I'm looking around and I'm seeing the individuals that now mind you the water that I came up in there are other people popping up all around me and it's been 10 years this summer so I've had time for God to reveal the truth of my experience to me and the people that were coming up out of the water were individuals dying over the face of the earth who had not yet received Christ and how many people die every minute all across the world how many people die without truly Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior? Now I say I know him, but he said, is he Lord and is he your Savior? See, that's a two different type of knowings. And God showed me that I was one of the ones that said I knew him, but yet didn't live for him. You know, I wasn't confessing his name like I am now. I wasn't in conversation like I am now. And many people were coming in. And I seen in that cave, <clears throat> I seen tunnels. And there were a few tunnels over here to the left part where I seen the individuals getting up and flowing and going to a pre-appointed place. Because they went without you know hesitation so <laughs> it was their destination you know and I'm looking and seeing these things and I'm drawing over here to my right to another tunnel that was kind of hidden but yet it was there and as I choose to go it wasn't it was just like you know instantly I'm right there at the entrance as I went to move I was there and as I, I'm there and I started to go in the tunnel and that's where you see a lot of clips where people make those uh, movies how they show you that people are bound to the walls and souls are stuck well I was coming through a place like that and that's where I seen you know the different souls that were on my left and on my right and they were stuck and they were bound in this place and couldn't get out and they cried and they cried and they cried and I wanted to help 
but I couldn't help. I had to keep going. You know, it was like instructions. You know, how there's a, a movie, Scare Straight, right? You know, how they took the young people through through the penitentiaries, you know. And it was kind of like that type of experience where Jesus Christ scared me straight. <laughs> to let me know that hell is real. You know, his word is real. He said, I can't, I can't lie. He said, I told Adam and Eve that they would surely die the day they touch of it. Now, Satan prompted a lie to say, you will not surely die. But do we not experience death now? Do we not experience sickness? Do we not experience sin? All these experiences that produce death in our lives, you know, and that was because of disobedience to God's word, what he said, the first word, don't touch it, that was a command, and by man diso being disobedient to that word, made the place where Jesus had to go and preach, after he, you know, went into the heart of the earth for three days, after he died on the cross, it said he went into the grave, for three days and it was a world that had lived that had never heard the gospel that Jesus Christ preached to and it said that he rose with all power and by him raising and coming back with all power gave me an experience and a chance to have this testimony to give truth to he does have all power and he did get up huh? so you're walking through that tunnel yeah. And you've seen these people screaming and yelling and calling out to you. What's going through your mind? What? <laughs> What's going on? You know, where am I at? And it was it was a trip just to to know that I deserved this place, but yet how I'm getting out of this place was 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 a miracle because I still didn't yet know that I was getting out when I was going where I was going. Are you panicking? No, there was no panic because you know, like judgment is judgment. <laughs> it, it's like when you go to court <laughs> and you got a speeding ticket mm -hmm. and the judge say you're guilty do you panic? Or do you just accept, you know you accept it because you know it was true. You were speeding. So, you know, just like I was saying, you know, as the judge makes his decision, you know, you already know within yourself that you're guilty or not guilty. But talking about, you know, the tunnel, you know, like I said, it was just uh, the weirdest experience ever coming through through that place you know like coming down you know you you being locked up <laughs> you just being convicted for to life in prison and you walking down you know the corridors where your cell is you know the the feeling that you have you know walking down holding your stuff you know your 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 new uh, pillow <laughs> your new blanket, your new toothbrush, and the things that they give you. You know, the, the steps that that individual is taking as he walks to his cell and and settles within himself and swallows and says, this is it. You know, it was one of them type of experiences. You know, and to have settled within myself that this is it, but yet still having hope that I could get out of here because even those that are doing life in prison somewhere deep down on the inside there is hope that I can get out of here and that's what I had I had down on the inside of me a hope that I could get out because I said if Jesus did it I could do it but I didn't know how Jesus did it until God showed me until I got to that point where it's further in the story as I got to the end of the tunnel I would come to a place where 
looks like a, a sinkhole. We know what a sinkhole looks like. You know, they show, you guys can check on the internet and see, just Google sinkholes and you'll see different type of holes that, you know, you don't know how deep they go down, but you don't want to get caught in one. But it was like that. A portion of the earth had sunk in to where I could come out if I made it across. But what was separating me on this side from that side was where God described in his word. There was a fixed chasm, a fixed pit of nothing, a separation. To separate them on that side from us on this side, that you can't even help them. You know, there's no there's no restoration for those on that side. So it was the 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 walls of the earth were on this side of me. But in front of me and on that was nothing. You know, it was like coming out a uh, a cave but at the corner of it. You know, to where the the walls of the earth are here but yet yeah, there's nothing. Deep darkness down there. Like coming to a cliff. <laughs> And as I started to climb out on the edge of the earth is when their vines and different things, you know, how roots and vines stick out of the earth. And I'm trying to climb out of this place and all of a sudden I slipped and I fell. I'm falling. And I grab hold to this vine and I catch hold to it. And I get a good grip on the vine and I just hang there. And as I'm hanging there over by the vine, I look over and I say it within myself. It's like uh, I'm not in there, in that in that place, but I'm going to just hang out right here. <laughs> because where I was, I was able to see the top of the earth. I was able to see the sun, the apartments, the, the top of the earth from coming out of this cave, out of this entrance, out of this tunnel and as I'm hanging there is when me and God when God has his conversation with me and God what he did I knew why I deserved, I knew why I was there because the life that I lived before that you know from being a pimp selling dope uh running, you know, drugs and women and, you know, just living a life, you know, having no good thing within my heart, nothing godly, you know, everything for self, for me, that's what I deserve, he said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, so God was showing me my check, this is, this is how much you about to get paid, son, Huh? But you didn't work so hard, right? And to show me my payment was death, was separation from God. And he said also, here's a check, but also there's a gift now. See, the gift is eternal life. You don't work for it, you just receive it. Well, how do I receive it? I believe unto this. And he says, you have to believe. So by him showing me the truth of his word, that hell is real. What else can I do but, but cry out to the Lord? And as I'm hanging over these, this separation, I'm looking up and I'm frightened from something behind me. You know, like, you know how you, somebody behind you instantly look behind you real quick? But I'm hanging overneath this separation. When I look down, I see you know, sticking out of the earth was the statue carved out of rock, the head of a demon. It was the head of a demon carved out of rock. You know how the kingdom. is. <laughs> mm. you know, you have like different things like on castles. They'll, you know, have different things to validate that's their kingdom. And... Was that a demon that you recognized? No, uh, that a photo the, you ever seen here on Earth? Well, no. Just the statue. Now, there's many different types of created heads, but just to know that that was no angel. 
you know, it was the statue head of a demonic force carved out of rock, sticking over the pit, but out of the earth. And I was hanging over over it, and God revealed to me, son, you're at the gates of hell. And right then I just held on. And in the midst of him revealing to me where I was, it's like Ezekiel when he said that he grabbed him by his hair and took him up into a valley of dry bones, right? And showed him. Took him up in the spirit and showed him some things. And God grabbed me and took me up to this future place to show me. Now what got me to the place where I was was unfaithfulness. But what's going to keep me here is faithfulness. Because he's a God of faithfulness. You know, and no one can be considered a child of God being unfaithful. You know, in, in marriage, to yourself, to your kids, you know, to, to people in general, all around you, you have to be a faithful person. Well, in order that I have a second chance, the second chance came with faithfulness. So I had to demonstrate faithfulness. You know, when before I was unfaithful in all my things. You know, to girlfriends, I was unfaithful. I had many girlfriends. And, were, and all of that was all wrong. It was all foul. You know, because in the midst of that, different things transpired. You know, I thank the Lord for saving me from, from real serious diseases. You feel me? And I thank Him for that. But God showed me the truth of his word. And for me to be faithful at this next juncture in life is what will bring me closer to Christ. And as I, you know, chose that place over the place where I was, you know, God gave it to me. And just like what he says in his word, that he goes away that he may send the comforter. And the comforter is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fell upon me and gave me power. And when he gave me power, I climbed up out of that sinkhole, of that hole, of that pit. And the second that I touched on to the top of the earth is when I... <sighs> pull out of this coma and I'm in the hospital but yet I'm not in the hospital because I'm running from where I'm running from but yet my body is tied down and doctors are standing over me and they're oh my god do you know anything do you remember anything and I'm trying to gain trying to breathe and I can't breathe because they're draining water and mud from my lungs they had a, a slit in the side of my side right here where they were draining you know water and mud from my lungs you see the cut right there you see it alright mm -hmm. that's where they cut me and put the tube in there to drain the water and mud out of me and on top of that they were, had a plunger like deal down my throat you know to gag it out to bring it up and Man, when I came out of the coma, you know, they were, it was, I was hot. I was, it was the, it was burning up. You know, it was so hot, I, I couldn't, couldn't stand it. I was hot. And man, I'm telling the, I, I can't speak because they got tubes down me. And I'm looking around, I'm, I'm burning up and I'm looking around and I'm, you know, trying to see who's in the room, and my body is weak, it's hurting real bad, and all of a sudden, man, I look and I scan the room, and I see my mother in the corner of the room over there, and that's what scared me. I'm, you know, really jumped. I'm like, you know, couldn't say nothing, but I'm saying it to myself, like, what you doing here? Because I just left you. I left you at home. What are you doing here? Where, where am I? Right now, not knowing that days have passed out of my life, you know, I just left my mother, but then for me to wake up out of this 
coma, it didn't seem like I was gone before a second. You know, just when I closed my eyes and woke up, but time had left. And seeing my mother in the room, and that just for real scared me to death. You know, and all of a sudden they had to tell me that my hand was gone because they had my head turned over here, position where I couldn't move it. But my hands was hurting. The, the way my jacket is sitting right here, my fingers should have been right here. So I'm laying here and my cousin came in the room and he said, man, we got to tell him. We got to tell him. I was like, I'm looking at him like, you got to tell me what? And he said, cuz, cuz, <laughs> cuz, <laughs> cuz. Cause your arm is gone. And I'm looking at him like, <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> My arm is gone. <clears throat> I go to patent for my hand because my hand's supposed to be on my stomach like this. Like this hand is. You know, my fingers are tingly. I want to rub them. I want to, you know, rub my hand and I get all the way over to the other side of my body. And I don't feel no hand. Yet I feel my hand, but I can't feel my hand. <laughs> now, Minister Tyrone, you yes, said sir. that when you was, uh, inhale, that when you looked where your arm was supposed to be, mm -hmm. you seen a blur. What yes. was that like? It was a blurred image. Because we don't get our glorified body until Jesus Christ come back. So, this word is true. You know, mm. so that's how I that's how I was. I wasn't in a glorified state. I was at a state of how I left here. You know, so when I climbed out of the pit, I knew also when I was hanging, I knew also that I only had one hand because I didn't have another hand to pull myself up with. So knowing all the time that. It was gone on the other side. I just couldn't do nothing about it. It wasn't like uh, a natural feeling where you're going to, oh, my hand. And it wasn't like that. It was, oh, it's not there. And, you know, just kept on going. But, you know, the the real worry was where I was, not what I didn't have. Now, you said, I remember you telling me that when you came out of that coma. Mm-hmm. Well, the main things you wanted to do was to call your grandmother. Why did you want to call your grandmother? Well, <clears throat> when I came out, what made me call her and made me want to call her was when God brought back to my memory <laughs> what had happened because I was in the hospital for 30 days. So for the first two weeks, it was major, you know, uh, morphine and different things to you know, for for this wound, right? So what God did, he waited till I was off everything. <laughs> to where I was on my way out, I was in the trauma unit. And that's, you're not in ICU, but you're in the trauma. Still, you know, taken care of, but not hooked up to the monitors and all of that. So in the trauma unit is when God reminded me, hey, don't forget this. And he took me back again. I was in the truck. Truck started flipping. From the flipping of the truck, tossing to the pond. From the pond, coming up in the tunnel, being in hell. From there, you know, seeing what I saw, going through the tunnel, coming to the end of the tunnel. All this stuff was going in super speed motion, but just reminded me of like how you press load on the computer to load the information was downloading everything that I've experienced back into me and when I realized where I had been I had been in hell and God had given me a second chance and I called I picked up the phone and I called the one person who I knew that knew him <laughs> and that was my grandmother because she was the 
the pillar of our family as far as being a saint for Christ. And I called her, you know, from the hospital room. And I was crying real bad. I was crying. This wasn't a normal cry. This was a really crying out. And I was crying out because I couldn't believe it. You know, I could believe it, but I couldn't believe it. You know, and to and to know that I know that we know that once a person get there, it's too late. But then for yet for God to have mercy and compassion on me, man, that was overwhelming. And I cried and I called my grandmother and she said, Hello <laughs> And I was crying. She said, Baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I'm ready, I'm ready. She was like Repeat after me. And she knew instantly what I was ready for. And those words came swift. You know, like she had been waiting. And she said, what's wrong? And when I cried out, she said, repeat after me. And we said the sinner's prayer right then. And I confess the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I confess that he died on the cross. And on the third day, God the Father rose him from the grave and I confessed that I was a sinner and I had invited him to come into my heart to be Lord and Savior of my life and from that moment <clears throat> it was a change and it happened in the room it was like someone cut on the lights and the room lit up and and uh, after the room lit up it was, uh, you know, I got off the phone with her. It was like the Spirit of the Lord had came in and had, you know, came to, to my room to rest with me. And the next day, my pastor, who is my pastor now, would come in. God would bring him in. And what that was, was how in the story of Jesus and Lazarus, not Lazarus and the rich man, but Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. When Lazarus had died, they buried him in his burial clothes. And when Jesus called Lazarus forth, he told the disciples to do something. And he told the disciples to loose him. You know, because he couldn't walk around like that. And that's likewise everyone who has been lifted from the dead has to be unwrapped because you got to come out of the way that you think about things, the way that you feel about things. And you have to come into the newness in which Christ has provided for you. And that's what God did in sending my pastor into the door. That, that next day he would receive me and <clears throat> through time of standing before God every Sunday, <laughs> every Wednesday and standing his word that that would be the methods to unwrap me mentally of my grave clothes, my thoughts of thinking the way I think to a new more excellent way of thinking to knowing that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what do I mean by that? Well, when he brought me back, he just didn't bring me back to have me to go through life, you know, with looking for handouts. What God did is that he blessed me. He said that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I had this situation to know that that scripture is true. What do I mean by that? I'm the first barber in the history of barbering to ever take and pass the exam with one hand. And I'm right-handed. So to take the exam with my left hand and pass and be the first licensed barber in the state of California to ever do this with one hand, all glory goes to God. But without me being in this condition, how could you ever know that he comes to give you life in that more abundantly. So even in a disabled state, 
I can eat real good. How? Through Christ who strengthens me. And also, you know, he's giving me this testimony to be an encourager for other people out there in the world. It may be physical or it may be mental disabilities that you have, but Christ tells you to be loosed from that way of thinking and be renewed again to have your mind renewed through his word because as you get in his word you see that you're able to do things contrary to the laws of nature because his word is the power over nature so when I got with this and yet I had these experiences to come upon me yet I had to apply it it's just like the woman with the issue of blood she has spun all she had until she come to this one point when she believed by faith that if she just touched the hem of his garment she will be made whole well this was one of those experiences where I had to provide for my family I'm married <clears throat> I'm a young man I'm not old I don't not gray hair but I still have a lot of heart in me but yet having a lot of heart and having this difficulty how could I get it done well, when I read in the Word, God showed me. So I come back really here today to to show evidence, you know, the power and the truth of God's Word for those that are believing and also for the unbelieving that <clears throat> in your situations that you're going through, God has purposely set to show you His glory that it may be revealed through you. So, it's like this situation, I couldn't run from it, I had to embrace it. And as I embraced it with Jesus Christ, I was able to be victorious over it. Father, we just thank you so much. There's no name above your name. I wouldn't serve any other name. Yeah, sure, Mashiach. There's power in the name There's victory in the name There's healing in the name Healing Anointing in the name Yes There is peace in the name If you would speak aloud Every name. Every time. Oh, 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 oh. The power in the name. Power in the name. Power. The victory in the name. There's healing in the So name. much healing. Anointing in the name. Bless your name.